Uh, bonjour tout le monde, uh, mon nom est Rosemary Thompson et uh, j'étais une journaliste pendant 22 ans avec uh, la Société Radio-Canada uh, à Winnipeg, à Montréal, um, à Washington et à Ottawa. Et depuis quatre ans, uh, je travaille dans les arts et um, c'est intéressant un peu uh, le, le, la puissance des arts et on va parler de ça un peu ce matin aussi. Um, it's a great honor to be here with you this morning uh, for this panel on human rights and dignity. Um, it's interesting because each of us have had a different role in, in kind of bringing uh, human rights and dignity to the fore internationally or domestically as a journalist, as an academic, as somebody who's worked on, on the field. And I think we all have different perspectives on this. But since this is the 10th anniversary and we're in Montreal, I thought I'd start off with just thinking about uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau and the different roles that he played in his own life. <coughs> I grew up in Montreal, and when I think about Mr. Trudeau, as a young person, he was an academic, and he tried to push his public policy and his big ideas through uh, universities and through teaching. But then he thought that wasn't quite enough. He had to become a journalist, and he founded Cité Libre, which we all remember, if those of us here and elsewhere. But that wasn't enough either. He used to have les colloques, un peu comme aujourd'hui. He'd have these big discussions in meeting rooms, just like this one, except they weren't quite as high-end as this. Uh, he wouldn't meet at the Westin. He liked going to La Maison Aigrole down in Verdun. And it's kind of a very, you know, mid-level Chinese restaurant, and it had a nice big room. And he would engage with uh, his colleagues and with big thinkers, uh, with journalists, uh, with just activists, to try and push his ideas forward. And when that wasn't enough, he decided to run for public office. And so he got into the political realm. And he did that, of course, as we all know, uh, for you know, more than a decade. But then when he retired, you know, he had a quieter life, I suppose. But when he decided that he wanted to get back into it again, he went back to La Maison Aigrel. So this kind of room. And he would publish an article. And I remember the one uh, during the constitutional debates around the Charlottetown Accord. And I was a young journalist. And my assignment editor said, it's Bernie Salaron, for those of you of Montreal, he said, Rosemary, get down to La Maison Aigrel. And I thought, oh boy, <laughs> let's see what this is all going to be about. But what happened was you heard this cogent argument, well-researched, well-thought-out, from an intellectual, and of course, a de which had devastating impact uh, nationally on, on, the, on the outcome of uh, the Charlottetown Accord. In fact, many people felt that that speech um, ended the Charlottetown Accord. So, what I guess I'm trying to say is that all of us come to this room from a different perspective, but uh, like Mr. Trudeau, we're all trying to do something positive for, um, I think, society and humanity, and so I kick off with that idea. But I wanted to start with the international, because you've both worked internationally. So, Stephen, what about human rights and dignity and Canada's place in this? Because we've just heard from Anne Veronics that Canadians have a desire to do good, to play a role, but how do you see us playing that role right now? Well, I think that um, it's always struck me that Canadians have, as part of their self-image and engagement with the world, uh, it, the whole sort of 1950s liberal internationalism was very powerful for a very long time in Canadian public discourse, uh, right into the 70s and 80s, I, I think, and even into the 90s to some extent. But at the same time, uh, we also see uh, the uh, survey results that show that Canadians, like most people around the world, and especially like Americans, focus very, very strongly on the domestic economy as a principal preoccupation for concrete decision making. So I think actually we have a little bit of a conundrum in the country, uh, historically, which is a self-image that's very strongly connected to a positive role in the world, notions of constructive middle power or model power, various uh, phrases have been used, and yet I think day to day most Canadians don't actually engage with that very strongly. And I go a step further to say that most Canadians don't know a lot about what's going on in the rest of the world. Uh, and that's for a whole set of reasons. It's partly because of the domination of uh, US perspectives in the media, because of our own weak media structures and culture, uh, which is, I think, uh, degenerating quite quickly in the country. Uh, very few opportunities to learn really very much about what's going on in the rest of the world. Uh, you put all that together, and I actually don't think we're in a very strong position, frankly. 
Um, if you travel around the world, as I know so many people who are associated with the Trudeau Foundation do, uh, the question that I keep being asked, and I have been now for roughly a decade, is, quotes, where's Canada? And the where's Canada question is uh, on the environment, it's on uh, engagement around uh, security outside of very carefully constructed uh, interventions, uh, partnering mostly with the United States, and especially, in my view, in the area of human rights, uh, I would add legal reform, constitutionalism, where there had been historic uh, places of deep engagement by Canadians, Sri Lanka, East Africa, South Africa, uh, parts of uh, the um, Southeast Asia. And now there are lots of Canadians working, but not for Canada. So Samantha, you're seeing that because you, you've been on the ground. And so how do you see it in the arc of the, you know, almost 20 years that you've been out there as a Canadian? Do you, do you think people are saying, where's Canada? Yeah, I mean, I wholeheartedly agree with, with everything that Stephen just said. I think that there is, there is very clearly a massive disconnect between the way that we self-identify as Canadians and the values that we think we represent in the world and, and reality. Um, and it's interesting because I remember we did an Enveronics poll, uh, Warchild did, about a decade ago of, you might recall this, of, of uh, young Canadians. And one of the things that we asked them was what they would consider to be Canada's biggest contribution on the international stage. And the vast majority of them, I think at the time it was about 70 or 80% of them came back and said peacekeeping. And yet at the time we were 52nd, I think, in the world in terms of our contribution to peacekeeping. And that's dropped even further. And so when you look at what we think that we are and the, the, the reputation um, that we rely on and, and what's become part of our identity and part of our brand, that is in no way aligned with the way that we are increasingly perceived. And there are a number of reasons for that, but when you're talking about most of my experiences either in war-torn countries in Africa, but also in Asia and the Middle East, and there is, uh, and there certainly has been this growing perception that um, rightly that our aid is now very closely aligned with self-interest with our trade agenda and that we no longer are investing in the, the kinds of uh, protection initiatives that that help the vulnerable that target the the most impoverished the most at-risk countries um, there is this sense that we are primarily acting in a way that advances our, our economic interests. Our mining uh, around the world has certainly hurt our global reputation in terms of our connection to uh, some fairly significant labor violations and human rights violations taking place around the world. Um, and at the same time, our, our particular position on Middle East politics as well has resulted in, um, I think the question is, is, is one of where is Canada, but the one that I'm confronting a lot of the time now is what is Canada? Because mm -hmm. it's not what we think it is, and it's certainly not um, what people had come to expect of us. Even, and perhaps especially, uh, in a, a multilateral sense as well. I mean, you look at Canada's role recently around the arms trade treaty, which we still haven't signed, which the Americans have signed, which we, 10 years ago, were one of the, the the advocates and the champions of this particular uh, piece of international legislation to bring about restrictions on the sale and transfer and stockpiling of, of small and light weapons in the world, which are uh, indiscriminate in terms of the impact that they have on, on civilian lives. And uh, our role in that process was one of obfuscation initially and then kind of reluctant engagement. And we invited our own gun lobby to participate in the negotiations. Um, it gave a fairly mediocre speech at the, at the UN that was uh, not even tepid support for this legislation. And then have basically stalled on, on, on signing it and making it anything that's meaningful, despite the fact that more than 80 countries around the world have. And so what is Canada? Um, and it's, uh, you know, we can keep polling ourselves and keep believing that we represent certain things, but uh, that just is not translating. If I could just add one piece, I, I think it's important not, of course, to romanticize where Canada was. Part of my point is, uh, 
Canada was never actually what it thought it was, mm -hmm. except for very, very brief moments of, uh, I think, great uh, optimism and commitment. And we're not on a panel about climate change and the environment, but it's not the case that we were fabulous and mm -hmm. now are terrible. We said we were fabulous, yeah, but we never were. Yeah, the rhetoric was better than the reality. Right? Right. And it's not dissimilar, I think, in certain other fields where there was a lot of talk about commitment, but not always a follow-up with concrete actions. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about uh, the recent um, changes around sort of the structures of government, where we have CETA now going into the Department of Foreign uh, Trade and Internet, and, and so we're having sort of the merging of those two departments. And I'm wondering uh, from, both, from both of you, is that positive or negative? I mean, the government would, would argue this is a positive thing. It allows for a coordinated approach, uh, you know, the lessening of silos and that type of thing. But on the ground, uh, when you're seeing, Samantha, defense, aid, trade in some instances, not so much when you're in a, in a war zone, but defense and aid, the sort of the, the, the lines becoming blurred, what are the positives or negatives in that type of uh, big policy change? If we're going to talk about CETA, I'm going to need a drink. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even noon. Um, look, the, the, certainly the merger of CETA into the Department of Foreign Affairs has been uh, and is problematic for a number of different reasons, in particular because of what it represents in terms of so closely aligning our, our aid agenda with our trade agenda and what that actually means in terms of our ability to react to and support vulnerable populations around the world and, and the, the need to de-link some of those activities, in particular because of uh, our, our engagement uh, in, in some of these conflict areas themselves. But, but there is a bigger problem here as well, um, because you can make the argument that to streamline the bureaucratic process, that that creates certain efficiencies, and it creates a level of reactivity that wasn't possible when you had CETA and you had this, these, this huge monolithic structure that was pretty near impossible to navigate even on the best of, of days. Um, but the, the, the difficulty here, or the bigger issue here, has to do with the ways in which we are um, using our aid and, and processing our aid and the fact that uh, in the last couple of years, uh, not only have we been cutting back as an overall percentage uh, in terms of our contribution to our foreign aid, at the same time, we have left significant amounts of money every year unspent. And that's the story that often doesn't get told, is why, why are we sitting on this money? Why is this money being rolled out as, as a big savings? And everybody's all excited because we're saving this money. And what is the cost of that? And what is that doing in terms of our ability to respond and to support and to be investing in the right kinds of sustainable development initiatives around the world? Um, and so that's not, that, that to me is, the, is, is a very, very big question and issue that the merging of CETA and DFA certainly does not address. Um, and that, in fact, the, the bigger question here is really what is the purpose of our aid? What do we want it to accomplish around the world? How does it align with what Canada's values are? And I know that conversations about values are always a, a very difficult, a very difficult and problematic conversation because everybody has different values. And so what does that actually mean? But there would be, there are many ways in which Canada can have uh, an important legacy in terms of our aid. And it, instead, what we have is something that's extraordinarily um, uh, muddled, uh, often highly ineffective, uh, unspent, lots of promises, few real commitments, few real opportunities to engage in the right way. Hmm. I actually don't think it matters structurally where CETA is, uh, truthfully. I think that's the wrong question. Hmm. Um, and the reason I say that is uh, it can be equally bad or relatively good uh, in both places. And in my view, it's been pretty bad where it was. Uh, and the reason I say that is not because of the very committed people who work in CETA and who I think struggle against remarkable odds to try to deliver what has often been a completely incoherent policy. Uh, but the politics of CETA in relation to foreign affairs and the politics of CETA in relation to the broader government has always been problematic. If you look at you know, who the CETA ministers have been over the years, with a couple of notable exceptions, they've been appalling mm. and ineffective at best and actually 
malicious, in my view, at worst, in terms of how money was actually spent and how money was tied to certain objectives that had nothing to do with development, uh, but regional development within Canada, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it's not like we had a great system and now it's going to get broken. I think the real question for me is what are the policies associated with development? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's not a structural question. It's really a question about what the government cares about, what its priorities are, and I think uh, Sam's captured largely what those priorities seem to be. So since we're on the international question, we're going to shift to domestic in a little bit. I want to open up uh, the mics on the floor, and please, we're, our, our theme right now is Canada and the World, Human Rights and Dignity. If you have a question for our panelists, please, uh, please come forward. Hello, I'm Catherine Duvern, I'm a fellow. Um, and so I spend a lot of time talking about this gap and making the point over and over again that, you know, Canada's just not as good as we think we are. I found myself arguing in court last year, we really have to bring our refugee law in line with the standards set by the United States because that's a better standard right now than uh, where we are on a lot of these things. But increasingly I'm wondering um, if my efforts to disabuse people of the notion of our goodness are actually, if that's really what one wants to be doing, or if one somehow wants as an advocate to be calling people back to that reality. And so I have spent, you know, just so much energy over the past decade hammering on about how rotten Canada is and how rottener it's getting. And, you know, at some level that message isn't getting through and I'm thinking maybe there's another thing to do than just hammer on about that reality. But I'm looking for some ideas about what that might be. And so that's my question. I think it's called the audacity of hope. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, look, I think that's a really important question. And mm -hmm. you know, as we were talking already, I, I was self-editing and saying to myself, oh my God, you don't you're want to be too like, depressing. You're going to sound like right. a grumpy old man if you keep this up. Uh, and, and that certainly can't be the right approach uh, for public engagement. Uh, I think, uh, I think clear-sighted assessment of where we are is very important for people who actually have the capacity to try to set policy and to try to imagine a future, but that's sure not the communication that needs to happen in a broader uh, context. So I think the second stage of all of this has to be that we look for clearer articulations of what Canada can be. What are its options internationally? And I think they're far more encouraging than what we have shrunken ourselves to over the course of the last few years. The, the reason people ask, where's Canada, is because they actually want Canadian mm -hmm. engagement. They want to hear some ideas coming from Canada, and we do have a tradition of great engagement around a whole set of issues. You know them, landmines, uh, you know them around some uh, past work on the environment, you know them in terms of international human rights, anti-apartheid. There have been moments of actual great clarity and purpose for Canadian engagement on these issues. We need to be able to articulate those purposes again. I, I, I would echo that, but I would also say that there is, it is important to still disabuse people of the notion that we are already there and we're already doing good things. Um, because you have to disabuse them of that notion before you can convince them that we do need uh, a new iteration of our foreign policy, a new iteration of our aid policy, and what that actually looks like. And there are multiple opportunities for us to, to just simply do better. And if we're looking for a list of ways in which we can do better, I mean, one is we certainly do need, the U.S. has Dodd-Frank, it's problematic as, as well, but we certainly do need uh, policies that will govern the behavior of our multinational enterprises operating, particularly in unstable parts of the world. We do need to re-engage with the arms trade treaty and with small arms and the impact that, that has on civilians. We need to do a better job of investing in post-conflict states, supporting governance, supporting democratic institutions, supporting the rule of law, providing training opportunities, and having a, co a cohesive aid policy that is uh, more than just short-term uh, emergency aid, largely focused reactive kind of activities, and something that is much more sustainable. And you can look to a number of different models around the world, whether it's the Norwegian model or whether it's the DFID model in the UK, which in that situation, you know, part of the, 
Part of the problem that I had with the CETA DFIG merger is that I really felt we were not asking the right question. The questions that we were asking was, is CETA effective? The answer was no. Are the CETA ministers effective? The answer was no. So in that case, it was, well, let's try to make it more effective by putting it in a place that we think is slightly more effective. Uh, when in fact, the questions that we should have been asking is, well, how do you actually create a portfolio around aid that gives it the weight and gives it the substance and gives it the opportunity to make a mark in the world, and what does that actually look like? And in that situation, the DFID model was to upgrade the aid, the, 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 the aid ministerial portfolio and to make it a more prominent cabinet role and to put better people behind it, to put more money behind it. Even in the midst of a brutal economic recession, the, the UK continued to make its, its commitments to aid and to try to achieve 0.7% within the five years that they had laid out, whereas Canada was cutting back and we weren't as heavily impacted. So it's... It, you know, that to me is really about, we, we just need to begin to have the conversation and to begin to point people in directions that we think are, are, are opportunities and that are viable and that, and that reflect who we are as oh. a country. So Emily White Kid is over here and she helped me prepare for this panel and Hi. there she is from NYU and she has a question. Hi, thank you. I'm a 2013 uh, scholar. So much of the discussion so far seems to have focused on what's lost in translation between professed values and policy impact. And here we're to talk about, talking about policy impact in the area of human rights and human dignity. So my question is actually for Professor Toop, because I just finished his book. And there much of the argument is that um, law's normativity, its pull and its purchase is actually experienced not just by a federal government, the state as we traditionally see it, by a, whole, by, by a whole host of actors. So I was wondering how you saw the productive potential of this, and maybe that was um, a means of hope in this discussion, which seems fairly hopeless so far. Thank you. It's wonderful that someone reads books. You know, one's, <laughs> one's books, it's great. Thank you very much. And congratulations on the uh, Trudeau Scholarship. Um, the, the argument I try to make, and I won't go into detail, is that it's absolutely fundamental to be thinking about how we generate shared understandings within society as a basis for the potential of normativity internationally. And I actually think it does tie in with what we've been saying, because if we understand that there is a values base that Canadians continue to support, and I'm very interested that it hasn't really changed dramatically mm -hmm. over the course of the last 10 years, then there is an opportunity for dialogue within the country that actually is rooted in some of those relatively broadly shared understandings that could then give us a platform on which to base a uh, recaptured engagement with international society around these questions. So I actually think what we're hearing from the data tells us there is hope, but you then need to have active conversation, mm -hmm. active democratic deliberation, and it has to be framed. And frankly, I don't think our current federal government has an interest because of its own priorities in framing the kind of dialogue that we're really talking about. So other elements of society have to find mechanisms to frame that dialogue. That's why something like the Trudeau Foundation exists in my view. It's one of those points in society around which dialogue can take place. And that means that we need people that are often called in the, in the literature norm entrepreneurs people who are actually trying to drive agendas, people like Sam. Sam's a classic no norm entrepreneur because she's passionate about issues like small arms, et cetera, and she is trying to get a discourse going, not only in Canada, but internationally, that could have the potential to create energy and excitement and then ultimately political salience. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a process that we're all part of but we're not part of it in ro uh, as robust a manner as we need to in our country right now. Thank you. Um, I'm Heidi Morisi, uh, 2011 uh, fellow, Trudeau fellow. Um, I have been actually sitting yesterday and today, people talking, scholars and experts talking about the role of Canada in the world and the question of human rights and dignity. And, what Canada does in, in those areas. I'm really a little bit concerned that uh, 
we are more traveling in the realm of abstract rather than concrete. Uh, in the last session, actually, the results of the survey was presented, and uh, one of which was that uh, overwhelming majority of Canadians consider Israel as a friend and Iran as an enemy. And in my view, that's the uh, clear example of how the, uh, dominant, the ideology of the dominant elite becomes the, the dominant ideology in the society. For example, when we talk about human rights and dignity, uh, we should uh, pay attention to the fact that Canada, like most of the Western countries, is very selective in terms of uh, whose human rights, which countries' uh, dictatorship they condemn and they uh, severe, for example, uh, um, ties, and which not. In terms of the uh, Canadian policy, just uh, an example is uh, our relationship with Israel. No mention was, sent, uh, was actually made yesterday and today about how Canada has become probably the spokesperson for uh, Netanyahu. Canada, Canadian government under the present uh, conservative government, for example, has cut the aids to UNRWA, United Nations uh, um, refugee uh, support for Palestinians, and provided it, in fact, when they are criticized, they say that, well, we provide the uh, fund instead to uh, the PA authority. But no one questions that because they are what the fund that they provide actually is for uh, training the police force in Palestine. So there are so many examples of these selective, ultra-right-wing policies of Canadian government when it comes to the question of human rights and dignity. I would really like the panel to address this uh, problem, the policy of the government. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your intervention, and I think that um, I think it speaks to a really a number of really important points. But one of them has to do with uh, with the narratives and who controls those narratives, and how do we change that narrative? How do we put a different narrative out there? And this is something that um, I've been wrestling with, frankly, for the last 20 years, because one of my great frustrations has always been, particularly in the NGO sector, um, and particularly as somebody who's on the front line of many conflicts and who's hearing uh, very directly from people on the ground uh, a, a very different perspective and a very different reality from what is uh, what makes it into our media um, and then what becomes part of our policy and what shapes our policy. And so often you hear uh, so-called experts out there talking about what should be happening in places like Afghanistan, um, who, you know, if, if, they, if they even went to Afghanistan, it was in the context of being part of the Canadian military and they never made it out of the green zone, and they've never actually, frankly, had a conversation on Chicken Street in the middle of downtown Kabul, right, uh, with people. And, and that's one of the great frustrations. And I think that part of your point actually taps into that idea of narrative and who, who actually is allowed to or has the opportunity to, to speak and to be heard. Um, and, and I think that it is incumbent upon all of us, if we truly are compassionate and engaged when it comes to human rights issues, to try to ensure that there is a diversity of voices and a diversity of opinions. And one of the ways that, that I try to do that, at least through my, through my writing and through my speaking, um, is not to talk so much about what I think and feel, but the stories of people that I meet and what they think and feel, and hopefully encourage that narrative uh, to be told and to get people to really reflect on it from a different perspective. But it will not change until we have people such as yourself and other people in this room who are willing to put their ideas and opinions out there, who are willing to write, who are trying to get published, who are trying to influence in a more humane way. Because for as long as we continue to talk about these ideas in, in the abstract, uh, without putting real people and real stories into that mix, 
Uh, it's very, very easy to intellectualize. It's very easy to look at it purely from a geopolitical and security point of view and to really forget that these are distinctly human stories and distinctly human decisions that have widespread implications uh, and, and, and impact on the lives of millions and millions of people. And that's been one of my great frustrations. And you even see it in the context of international aid and nonprofits. You know, so much of the story is often told in a way that is. Uh, either extremely manipulative, whether it's sponsoring a child, whether it's giving a goat, whether it's, you know, it, it is ultimately uh, this kind of neo-colonial, neoliberalism that can actually be very, uh, in, in my view anyhow, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it, ultimately it does us a disservice because we, we end up maintaining these very stereotypical views of people who are, who are living with war and who are uh, extremely brave and extremely courageous and who could be providing uh, much, I think, a much greater, a much greater voice uh, and input into this conversation. So I don't know if I've answered your question other than to say that I agree with you, but the problem is really one of how we tell the stories and how we engage in the debate. Mm -hmm. And that has to really happen, in my experience and opinion, at a very personal level. And the more times we can have that personal connection, whether it's through writing, whether it's your books, whether it's through articles, whether it's through conversation, whether it's through speeches, uh, the more that we can put that forward, uh, the, the better off we will be. There are so many elements to your question, but uh, I, I do want to support what Sam's saying about making sure we find ways for, for a diversity of voices to be heard. I think that that's the only way in which we can sh start to shift the kind of shared understanding that I talked about earlier. If what you have is a pretty monolithic presentation of what matters and what doesn't matter, which is I think unfortunately what the, the North American media generally presents in relation to Israel and Palestine and the Middle East more broadly, uh, it's very hard for people who don't immerse themselves in a subject matter to have anything other than the dominantly constructed view. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I would say, you know, you could dislike or like uh, the approach of this government, but it's obviously popular and the government uh, uh, has been uh, re-elected. Uh, and certainly the discourse around its support, its unqualified support for Israel, uh, not for Israel, for this Israeli government, let's be clear. Uh, it doesn't seem to have had an impact whatsoever on their uh, prospects in the Canadian electoral campaign. And I think that's largely because people really don't know very much. Despite it being on the front page, they haven't immersed themselves in it, they haven't heard a diversity of voices. So I think that is hugely important. The only other thing I would add is that I, you will always have a sense of incompleteness around the promotion and protection of human rights. You will never be, we will never be able to achieve, sadly, uh, an absolute coherence because human rights is part of a political process and sets of political processes. And that means there are going to be a range of considerations. Human rights is not simply a trump card that you can play to eliminate all other political dialogue. Maybe it would be great if it were, because we might make more progress, but practically, to your point, it's not. And so it's going to be factored in. Syria is the great example right mm -hmm. now, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yes, people concerned about human rights. I actually think we have made some progress around chemical weapons, and we could talk about that later. In, in Syria, I think where we've got to is better than probably what we might have seen if there had been some kind of uh, dramatic uh, use of uh, armed force against Syria, but we have not dealt with the fundamental problem of the regime, and it doesn't look like we're going to, because there really is no broader political sense that we have the capacity to do that, and that's the nature of human rights, part of a very messy set of political processes. I'm uh, Ronald Rudin. I Professor of History at Concordia and a Trudeau Fellow. So I want to try to connect a couple of the threads that have been uh, raised here about the uh, sort of benign view uh, that's generated by the, um, the, the, the survey, um, the dismal record on the ground in foreign affairs and the stories that we tell about ourselves. And I think the, the, the element for me, so I, it's why I 
advertise myself as a historian uh, are the stories we tell about ourselves in terms of our own history and our own identity in the public sphere. So, uh, and I think sometimes what happens is uh, in this conversation, for instance, we're talking about what we do external to Canada and we take the views of ourselves, but there are also the stories we tell within Canada about ourselves, which are then reflected in the policies that we have. And so I guess I, I don't, this isn't gonna come across as a positive note, but I'd be interested in your response. Uh, you know, it's, it's commonly now, the expression is commonly used in terms of the uh, current government's view of the past is to rebrand Canada as a warrior nation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have evidence about this, right? Uh, the incredible amount of money spent on the bicentenary of the War of 1812, and maybe more concerning, the rebranding of the Canadian Museum of Civilization as the Canadian Museum of History, whose content uh, is not entirely known to us, but from what we know, is going to present a very different view of Canada, one that isn't so much beginning with the Aboriginal people and is based upon a very different uh, construction of Canada's past. So I guess my concern uh, is that while the survey data may be not too concerning now, there's a, a kind of construction of our identity which will be permanent, right? That museum will be there for a long time. And I guess my question is um, how we connect the stories we tell about ourselves internally and how that plays into uh, the role that we play in a larger world. I think that's an excellent question. I think it's actually, um, it's hard to respond to because it is uh, a, a very astute observation and it's one that um, I think it ultimately comes down to, again, this, this issue of narratives and who's telling those narratives and how we respond to them. One is to, uh, and we have certainly seen this, the, 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 the clear uh, identification of Canada as much more of a warrior nation, the celebration of the War of 1812, I mean, it goes, it goes on and on and on and on. Um, and the way that the stories from Afghanistan were told um, and, the, you know, certain personalities and, and talking about killing scumbags in Afghanistan and all this kind of stuff um, that, that really cha that created a, a new dialogue and a new rhetoric when it comes to Canada's role in the world and, and how we also see ourselves. Um, and it was amazing to me how quickly that pendulum actually swung. And, um, and I, I'm trying to sort of explain this, this correctly, but you know, five or 10 years ago, if you were out, as I was, you know, talking about Canada and talking about uh, our armed forces and the kinds of things that we would hope uh, we would be contributing to on an international level, and when you talk about peacekeeping, um, you weren't meet it, you weren't you weren't met with the same level of aggression and disdain and criticism that now exists. And I'll give you a really perfect recent example. I was one of the jurors for the Weston Prize this year for the Writers Trust, and the book that we selected was Graham Smith. He's a writer for the Globe and Mail, uh, covered Afghanistan. It's a fantastic, uh, really profoundly called The Dogs Are Eating Them Now, looking at essentially um, the, the myth of our success in Afghanistan and what we, what we actually were doing and whether it really accomplished any of its goals and what the future is going to look like. Um, and I, we all felt it was a very important book, Evan Solomon was another judge, that, that Canadians, it offered a different perspective on, on the conflict. Even when uh, you know, we announced the results, I was inundated with people on Twitter essentially telling me that I had disrespected all of the soldiers by choosing this book and you know, I should be happy to be alive and I should thank my lucky stars that Canada's military is out there advancing democracy because otherwise people like me couldn't have opinions. And it is, you could say that that's social media and that's just the way it is, maybe. Um, but I actually think it reflects a, a, a bigger trend towards intolerance when it comes to discussion and debate and dialogue. And that is because we have adopted the same kind of U.S. Uh, mechanism for creating ideological rifts and for growing political support based on those, those very solidly ideological positions. 
Um, and so to answer your question around how do we really shift that, I think that the only way that you can continue to do that is to continue to have a different kind of conversation and to continue to put forward ideas and opinions that question and challenge the status quo. And the biggest danger in all of this to me, you know, it's not so much the propagandistic use of our, our tax dollars to put out commercials and everything else that, that create a different narrative. To me, it's when people start messing, for example, with our educational curriculum, uh, which again is sending different messages and you have younger and younger, younger people who are growing up, my son's in grade three, with different messages around Canada's history, around our citizenship, around what we represent in the world, because that is generational change. And so while it may not be reflected in the surveys that we're seeing today, chances are it's gonna be reflected in the surveys that we see 10, 15 years from now. And, and I think that has very profound consequences. Um, you know, and I think it's incumbent on all of us who, who support a different ethos to, to make sure, uh, moving forward, that we're, that we're trying to, to prevent against that. I, I agree with the premise uh, entirely of, of the question. Um, and I do think that there have been very concerted efforts to try to rebrand Canada more in terms of its military engagements uh, in an active, uh, robust sense of war as opposed to peacekeeping or peacemaking, etc. Intriguingly though, I would also say, uh, again, given what the polling data tells us, I'm not sure that they've worked. Uh, and I think there are a couple of other reasons that they haven't worked. We can't procure military equipment in this country. We have no capacity to do it, it appears. And therefore, <laughs> we can't actually support the rhetoric with actual engagement. And this is not uh, about this government. This has been a phenomenon now for 25 or 30 years. And it may actually have to do with uh, our discomfort about actually making these kinds of expenditures as a nation, intriguingly. I would say that there's been an attempt to try to uh, argue that Canada is more engaged now than it has been historically. And I've heard that from uh, various cabinet ministers over the years. And again, I would simply re reaffirm that all of my own experience internationally would tell me exactly the opposite. That the very targeted engagement in Afghanistan, yes, created for a short time some sense of collaboration with our NATO partners, uh, particularly with the United States, but really I don't think has had any uh, longer term consequences uh, for Canada being perceived as an important partner in these ventures. I think it's going to go down in history as rather uh, an adventure, uh, not a long term uh, commitment. And so I'd, a I'd end by saying if we're telling stories about ourselves, which I think is absolutely crucial, uh, we'll get to this I suspect, but one of the stories that we have to be telling about ourselves is our own internal failures around human rights uh, challenges. And the one that really strikes me right now, because I've just been engaged with it fairly actively, is the whole truth and reconciliation process with First Nations peoples across the country. I mean, we, we read stories in our press about how Japanese textbooks don't tell the truth about the Nanjing massacre, et cetera. Well, we have exactly the same situation here. Generations of children learning nothing about really one of the most appalling circumstances in Canadian history. And of course, they weren't learning for a long time about Japanese internments either, etc. So we have to do some self-analysis around the stories that we tell ourselves about our own country, as well as thinking about how that engages internationally. So that's a great segue to looking at ourselves internally, domestically, human rights and dignity in Canada itself. And, um, and I'm, I'm really interested in what you say because part of this is media's problem. Truth and Reconciliation was rolling when I was still a journalist and journalistic organizations in this country were largely not covering it as we don't really cover in a very profound way international development anymore. And it's because of the shrinking resources and less time and Twitter and blogging and all the rest. But if we can't cover things internationally and we're not choosing not to domestically, uh, what do we learn from that? And, and how do each of you see uh, what we're, we're doing with human rights and dignity at home? 
Well, we have lots of coverage of the Ford brothers starring in The Hangover <laughs> 4. Um, the frat and the furious. The, uh, He'll go off to rehab at some point. <laughs> have, I'm sure it'll happen. Yeah, it's hard not to get cynical. Um, well, you know, we, we, we don't. We certainly don't cover, we don't, we're not having this conversation enough. Um, and, and, and I do think that the, with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission there, I was shocked at how little coverage there actually was of that. Um, I mean, there was, there was some coverage, but the fact that it didn't get into great detail around what Canada's human rights record is and, uh, you know, where we want, where we see ourselves moving forward, that, that was kind of surprising to me. I don't, I don't know if you have any comments on that as, as well, but um, there, you know, it's, it, it is frustrating, and uh, at the same time, people will say, well, don't worry too much about it, because now there's so many more opportunities for other people to get that out. So you don't need the CBC to be covering it, you don't need the Globe Mail to be covering it, because, you know, some guy who's blogging from Afghanistan is covering it. And, but the reality is that still, you know, getting access to that information, knowing what information is reliable, you'll still need a mainstream press to be able to communicate those ideas and have that conversation on a national level. And frankly, this is part of the, of the problem as we continue to shrink our foreign bureaus, as we continue to shrink our level of reporting, as we continue to, to go with what is sensational and what is spectacle as opposed to what is uh, more profoundly political or analytical, um, we lose a great deal in that. And, and that is a model that unfortunately we, we have been replicating that I think comes from the US. Um, and it's, 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 it's a reaction to shrinking margins for broadcasters and shrinking advertising opportunities. And so instead they're giving people what they want all of the time as opposed to providing things that they may not have known that they wanted. I'm just going to add a couple of uh, thoughts about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I, I went uh, and on behalf of the University of British Columbia made a formal apology uh, at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, meeting in Vancouver, an apology for not having engaged, not having been part of telling the story uh, from the perspective of Canadian history, not having stood up uh, early on uh, in the whole process and then until very recently. And one of the things that really struck me, uh, there were a, a lot of people, there were thousands of people at this event, mostly Aboriginal folk, uh, who were, I think, frankly, many of them simply trying to process what had happened to themselves and their families. And that's something that we have to understand as Canadians. This isn't about individual bad things that happened to a bunch of people. It's actually about a policy which resulted in the systematic disempowerment of generations of Aboriginal peoples. First Nations peoples across the country. And that has profound consequences for a whole series of current political and economic issues. Mm -hmm. This is something that I've learned since going to, to uh, BC. It was not as pronounced for me here when I lived in Quebec. Mm -hmm. But in BC, if we don't, and it's even more true in the prairies, if we don't engage effectively with the only growing population aside from immigration, in our country, we're going to fail. And if we don't find a mechanism to help people feel part of a future that they can see themselves being excited by, we're going to have a continuing series of, um, I think, really uh, negative circumstances around all of our attempts to create pipelines and to create uh, offshore oil delivery or l natural gas delivery, liquefied natural gas. I mean, these are concrete, back to the earlier point, very concrete things that will happen or won't happen, in my view, in part on the question whether or not we actually listen to where Aboriginal people are. And to listen to them, we have to understand the profound dislocation in their communities that resulted from the Aboriginal school experience. And frankly, I don't think most Canadians get that. And I'm not blaming people back to the issue of lack of coverage, et cetera, et cetera, but we have to do better. Hmm. But we saw that extraordinary walk from the north to Parliament Hill, which was 
symbolically incredible and received widespread attention. And the nation, I think, really was captivated by that and, and thought about it. And they saw Teresa Spence in that tent uh, last winter and felt, I think, compassion for her. I mean, not always going to have universal approval for, but for what happened. But, but it seems that the agenda is moving forward. It's taking more prominence. Um, but it's, it's always, I always call it, it's a little bit like I'm passing the so Teresa Spence is passing the baton to the journalist or to the politician, and then maybe it goes into the bureaucracy or policymakers or academia, and then it becomes change. But I don't see the baton going from one place to the other. It seems to get stuck. And I'm not sure why that is. Maybe it's just a lack of will, or what are your views well, on that? Well, we have to be honest that part of the problem is that there's a huge dysfunction within Aboriginal politics mm -hmm. across the That's nation true. as well. I mean, we can't pretend that this is all about uh, other people creating difficulties. It's, very, it's been very, very difficult for there to be uh, a strongly coherent set of voices emerging around these core issues. I mean, even when it looked like, for example, there would be a very, very strong push around education. Uh, I'm not now talking about the government's response, which you can criticize, but even within Aboriginal mm -hmm. communities, there's been a very strong difference, set of differences of opinion that have emerged around how to proceed. And again, I think that part of what one has to understand there is a deeply felt sense of distrust, uncertainty, and anger that exists in some communities. In others, it's changed, it's, it's moved in a different direction, but that's always going to be a fundamental challenge, at least in the foreseeable future, for big handing on of the baton mm -hmm. uh, around large, large issues. And it, it may very well be that a lot of the um, solutions here are going to have to be more locally crafted solutions that pay very due attention to very specific historical and geographic and social circumstances. Okay, let's go to the floor. Hello, my name is Carmen Blake, I'm McGill alumni, and um, I think of Canada, I would like to say, as a big boat. And there are four groups inside that boat. Uh, I've been uh, naturalized into this country. I was born uh, in Europe. And here we have the four groups inside the boat, but we're all at sea in this boat. <laughs> and uh, of course we have the French descendants, the English descendants, the aboriginals who were in the boat before everybody else. And last but not least, the immigrants. Mm -hmm. I think that in order to make it work, we need to have a dialogue. And we have to uh, make sure that we can find solutions and leave the disputes of the past. Let, let go of those disputes and start working toward a tomorrow where we can all contribute and I think that uh, in the words of uh, Fanny Lou Hammer, she said that uh, nobody's free until everybody's free. We cannot expect that uh, Canada will go forward with the situations that we have right now in terms of Aboriginal people, as you were saying, is, is, is ex excruciatingly important that we solve that problem so that we can go to foreign countries and uh, say proudly that we are Canadians and that we respect human rights. I think uh, our uh, cohesion within Canada is most important before we go anywhere else. We see the situation of our neighbor to the south um, with so many interior problems um, trying to solve the problems of everybody else around the globe. And I think that is not a good policy. We need to solve the problems at home and sail together towards a good future. Um, no, I can comment. I, I thank you for that. I think that was a very thoughtful uh, an analysis and analogy as well. Um, the only thing that sometimes concerns me with those kinds of approaches is that we have this sense that 
charity, for lack of a better word, begins at home, right? That's the common trope that we all haul out there. And, and, and that often gets used as a reason for us to, to not engage in, in other parts of the world, in places where, uh, where in fact there is huge need and where the opportunities to um, promote civil society, to protect human rights, to work with vulnerable groups in those situations um, are very real and where we can actually make a difference. So I think if we, the only thing I, I, I worry about in terms of that I, idea is I, I, I think, think obviously, obviously yes, yes, we, we need, need to work, work to protect, protect human rights at home, we need to have a conversation around what that means um, in the right kind of way. I mean, we could talk about the Quebec Charter, which we haven't talked about just yet, um, you know, and, and what people, how people perceive human rights at home and what that actually means. Um, you know, certainly that has to take place. But again, I don't think that has to be at the exclusion or should be at the exclusion of some of these other activities because I think that there is a really important role that, that we, we need to play, to play um, or, or that we, we can, can play on that and, and that we're being asked to play as well. Uh, I would agree with Sam, uh, but I would add, I think we have to be very careful. I, I like your analogy of the boat. I actually think it's more like Noah's Ark than having four groups. Uh, one of the things that's so powerful to me living now in the lower mainland of British Columbia is the extraordinary diversity of the immigrant community. And we can't imagine that immigrants are themselves a collectivity. As we know, there are people coming from hundreds of different places all around the world. But more provocatively, I think, um, we at uh, the University of British Columbia in our last strategic plan declared that one of our core purposes was to try to uh, create the opportunity for intercultural dialogue. And the reason we did that was because we realized that the future, indeed the present in some parts of Canada, like my own now, uh, but the future is going to be intercultural in the sense that there will be people from all over the world that have to find ways of understanding one another so that they can work together. And that seems absolutely obvious, but let me tell you a little story. We did a survey of our own students and we discovered that for Chinese students coming to the University of British Columbia, their most difficult integrative moments were with Canadian Chinese students who the Chinese thought, quotes, looked down on them. So it's not the case that there's a plug and play with diaspora communities and new arrivals. And in fact, for any of you who know about the history here, Hong Kong students, mainland Chinese students, Canadian Chinese students have very different constructions of their self-identity and even of their values. And we have to be very, very aware of that. And it results in, I'll use the strong term, ghettoization, even among that seemingly um, monolithic community. And I think you could repeat that kind of history in many other ways. All of that to say that I think Canada is going to have to be extraordinarily sensitive going forward about the deep diversity, not the superficial you know, dances on Saturday afternoon diversity, but deep diversity of value and perspective that is now fundamentally at the heart of our country. Just, just before we go back to the floor, because we only have really 15 more minutes, but this is, you're, you're moving, we're moving into the Quebec, we wanted to talk about the Quebec Charter, and really when you speak about diversity, it's an opportunity to look at, at what Quebec is proposing right now. Um, it's, uh, it, this is a toughie, I mean, you know, what do you say? Uh, Stephen well, well, I mean, it's, what do you it's, say? It's, We've talked about this on the phone and you, yeah. you've had... It's, it's tough only, for me, it's tough only because what I have to say is not easy to say. Um, I don't think it's tough at all in mm -hmm. terms of the concept uh, involved. I think right. it's actually very easy. This, in my view, is a piece of uh, proposed legislation that is a solution seeking a problem that doesn't exist. Mm. Uh, and that's the worst element of the beginning point. The more objectionable element, in my view, is that I think it is nothing more uh, 
than an absolutely crass wedge issue that's designed to try and create uh, a different tenor to the next election campaign. And that's, you know, fair enough politically, but I think it is profoundly irresponsible socially and culturally. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that in Quebec there has been an amazing uh, conversation that took place sponsored uh, by Monsieur Bouchard and, and, uh, and Professor Taylor that actually was quite sophisticated, thoughtful, uh, was in response to some craziness that happened uh, around the province, but actually came up with an approach that really made a lot of sense. And for that now to have been essentially ignored uh, worries me. And here, there's, here's, I noticed one really interesting thing in your survey data. Where are people in Canada most likely to see discrimination against Muslims? Quebec, mm -hmm. 56%. So that's the good news. There's some good news here. I, I, I'm a Quebecer by origin, and I'll say at heart. And I don't believe that this speaks to the Quebec that I grew up in, and I don't believe that it will be successful in the long term. I think it is appalling. I'm going to add to that. Um, I'm of the view that secular fascism is not qualitatively or quantitatively different from religious fascism. Um, but, but also, I want to just look at it from a, a women's rights and women's perspective, because this has obviously been something that has become the polarizing issue with respect to this, is, is you know, well, we're, we're trying to protect women, we're trying to do this, we're trying to do that, and, and so it's couched in this kind of language that, um, in terms of the arguments that have been put forward in favor of it, um, that I have found deeply problematic. I have worked all around the world in places where I have had to uh, cover in various ways and do things that, you know, for me personally, it's not a choice that, um, that I would make or would want to make. Uh, at the same time, you, you obviously respect local norms and customs and traditions, and, 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 and that's that. Um, but I have found with this, the, the thing that to me is most deeply problematic that is part of this that hasn't really been discussed, is that to mandate for that women uh, wear certain clothing, anything, whatever it happens to be, um, and to mandate that they don't wear it, mm -hmm. is it's two halves of the same paternalism. And, and that's the part of the conversation that I think we, we haven't begun to address. And, and what's interesting is that it, there are obviously degrees of scale, but let's talk about the burqa, for example, and I've worked in Afghanistan and, and, and other environments that are extremely harsh to women. Um, this, to me, when I, when I think about, well, what is the ultimate goal? If the ultimate goal is to ensure that women have choices, genuine choices, um, that they can live in, in, a, in a fashion that is uh, full of autonomy and opportunity, um, you can look at how patterns of behavior have changed on other issues. So for example, female genital mutilation in the Horn of Africa. Um, you know, yes, there has been legislation that's been brought forward rightly because it is mutilation, it is amputation. At the same time, what has really changed behaviors? What has achieved a reduction in the practice of female genital mutilation? And it is led by uh, women themselves, it is led by their education, their political empowerment, their social empowerment, and it's also been led by religious leaders too in that process, and it, and it has taken time. And so really, if this is the heart of the matter, if we want to really help women achieve choices and dignity and autonomy, then the Charter goes about it in entirely the wrong way. Uh, and so that is just to sort of add to, to what you've said, that, it's, it, that even if you support the notion uh, in certain areas, it, that's just not what is going to accomplish it. Hi, good morning. My name is Erika Licon from Concordia University. Um, talking about going back to human rights and dignity and the role of international cooperation, I come from Mexico and I would like to share my vision of this both and how I would like to see how I have seen human rights violations documented from multinational companies and at the same time from the same countries uh, we have international development agency doing work almost in the same region. And what I would like to see is that 
uh, that these international development agencies, I would like to see their role as ensuring that their own uh, home companies uh, respect human rights. And, <clears throat> and I, I, because the problem we have is that they can go back to their countries at, in, at any point and they are not prosecuted for what they, they do. So I think that it starts at home, it starts at home, but also not only in their country, but in the other places. Thank you. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, one of the big missing pieces in my mind uh, when it comes to the International Criminal Court was the right to actually prosecute corporations that were involved in or, or could be implicated in atrocities in other parts of the world. Um, and, uh, you know, I've spoken, I know Lord Axworthy was, was here uh, yesterday, and this is a conversation that he and I have had over the years as well, and it was something that they flagged very early on as being, as being necessary, uh, because you do run into jurisdictional issues, and that is one of the main challenges. So uh, if you want to sue a corporation that's involved in labor or human rights violations, where do you do that? And there are multiple examples where where people, groups have tried to sue from the Eastern Congo uh, related to the death of civilians and the, and the rape of, uh, of women. Um, and, you know, the Quebec court said that it could proceed. It was against the Canadian company, uh, Anvil. The Quebec court said that they could proceed. The Supreme Court said that they could not. You've seen this in the U.S. with lawsuits against oil companies, um, that this, the jurisdictional problem is, uh, uh, when it comes to the law anyway, is, is, is the biggest obstacle. Uh, it is the missing piece. I do think, though, um, that one of the areas where there is still potential here has to do with governance and the question of governance at a board level for corporations. And you are seeing uh, much more investor activism around this where uh, Asset managers, small, medium, large asset groups uh, are actually the ones that are pressing corporations for reform and seeing that as, as a legal responsibility that those corporations have to their shareholders from a governance perspective. And you've seen actions taken related to the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. You've seen actions taken recently anyway in the Netherlands uh, and in Norway and elsewhere against companies that weren't meeting that, uh, that responsibility. And, and so I think that it sounds a bit convoluted, but where you can't actually prosecute uh, on the basis of human rights, it appears that the, a window is opening or a door is opening to be able to prosecute around questions of risk and governance and, and uh, what that represents to shareholders. And from my perspective, I don't care how you get there, as long as the message is one that promotes uh, greater responsibility and accountability in those environments. Jean-Marc Mangin, avec la Fédération canadienne des sciences humaines. Euh, je vais retourner à la charte, si on peut. Euh, je suis complètement d'accord avec euh, vos critiques euh, de, de, ce, de cette charte. Et avec, on voit les dérapages cette, cette semaine qui continuent, avec la chasse aux sorcières des, des femmes qui travaillent dans les garderies privées qui portent les euh, Cependant, nos, nos critiques euh, semblent confirmer la vision d'eux-mêmes que les nationalistes ethniques québécois euh, ont de, 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 de leur société, de notre société. Et, euh, et, et ils disent « Ah, vous voyez, c'est des euh, multiculturalistes à la Trudeau, ils ne comprennent pas le Québec, euh, et, euh, et, et, et c'est une forme de domination, et, et nous, on fait partie d'un universalisme euh, à la française, euh, euh, d'un style européen, c'est une vision de laïcité qui est di divorcée de notre réalité, mais il n'y a, euh, a, a pas de dialogue. Il y a des positions très, 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 très euh, euh, qui, qui, sont, euh, qui sont formalisées. Et euh, sur le plan politique, ça semble relativement populaire avec euh, cette, cette, cette politique euh, dangereuse euh, semble relativement populaire avec près de 50 de la population. On verra aux prochaines élections. Mais euh, comment qu'on puisse vraiment avoir brisé, brisé ce, ce, ce mur mm. et, et d'éviter des dérapages encore plus sérieux euh, pour le futur des, des droits de la personne au Québec, mais aussi la, et, et, et M. Chaudhry hier l'a mentionné, l'impact énorme que ça sur le, sur le Canada ou, au point de vue international. Mm 
Donc, quand, comment qu'on puisse limiter les dégâts d'aller plus de l'avant? Est-ce qu'on est, est qu doit aller euh, déjà penser à un, à un processus à la, à la, à la légale? Euh, est -ce que les, les, mais ça va confirmer encore plus le, narratif, le cadre narratif que, les, que le gouvernement québécois a, 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 a de, de lui-même. Donc, comment qu'on puisse euh, avancer ce débat de façon constructive? Merci. J'ai besoin de l'aide. Euh, vous avez décrit un euh, débat au long terme, évidemment. Euh, I I, I'm really struggling with this, I'll be honest, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak in English because it's just easier for me when I'm really struggling. Uh, struggling intellectually because I think we have wanted for a very long time to be aware of the distinctiveness of Quebec society. And, and it, It is distinctive in the Canadian context. I, you know, I don't think we need to debate that anymore. Um, my concern, though, is that although one could say that this uh, particular approach in the Charter is rooted in uh, l'esté, uh, uh, in the French model, um, that actually isn't the historic Canadian constitutional structure. Uh, it is fundamentally different in Canada from France. Uh, remember that when we created the compact that is Canada, there was specific recognition of uh, Protestant and Catholic at that time uh, realities in the country and a desire to hold them together through this new constitution. So there has never been in the, in the same way that it is currently being described. I would also say that uh, if you look at the relative successes of what I would describe as a Canadian model and the French model, I'd pick the Canadian model. Uh, if you look at uh, les banlieues autour de Paris, uh, that is not a model that any of us should want to uphold in my view. I don't believe that the Constitution of Canada is so rigid that it either demands uh, public support for any particular religion, nor does it demand, and in, th in fact I think it prohibits with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and the Quebec Charter, it prohibits a complete uh, suppression of any religious expression. So how do, we, how do we work our way out of that? How do we briser uh, le mur? And I think <laughs> it, it, the only way we can continue to do it is by having the kind of dialogue that I think Quebec has historically promoted. And that's why I went back to uh, the Bouchard-Taylor Commission. Not perfect, but boy, a good model of democratic engagement and deliberative democracy functioning across the province. And so I hope uh, that uh, there is a very clear attempt on the part of those who are worried about the Charter within Quebec to find mechanisms to continue a dialogue in the line of the Taylor Bouchard work. I will also say that the rest of Canada cannot be smug on this. Uh, the day that the Charter was passed, I made it my uh, uh, penance to read the commentary sector sections of, you know, the oh, National the Post yeah. and the Globe You never and recover Mail, from that. Et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> I, I, usually, I usually... Never go there. I usually don't because it's just too depressing. But I did on that day, and there's a lot of people across Canada who have exactly the same view mm -hmm. as being promoted, in my view, in the Charter. So this isn't an English-French thing. I think it finds an expression because of the historical connection to laïcité that can be framed differently in Quebec than it is in the rest of Canada. But these challenges exist everywhere in our country, and the only way we're going to get out of them is not by creating rigid barriers that make it impossible to have a conversation. And I think that that's what this charter does.
Well, it's, it's just, it, it's, it's xenophobia, right? I mean, that, you, get, you get that everywhere. It just, it's just people, people ride that kind of populist wave. It's a lot easier. And you've, I've seen this all around the world. I mean, whether you're talking about Iraq under Saddam Hussein, it, it's a lot easier to rally support uh, against the, the enemy from without than the enemy from within, unfortunately. So I hate to tell you this, it's 10.30 and we're at time, but um, on the note of conversation, conversation, breaking down walls through conversation and discussions like this, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Stephen Toop and Dr. Samantha Nutt for their wonderful presentations today. Merci beaucoup.